Saturday morning in Festive Road. Coal was being delivered and boys were playing with wooden swords. Everything was very ordinary. This is an ordinary street. At number 52, the postman arrived with a letter. Number 52 is Mr. Ben's house and Mr. Ben was at the front door to meet the postman. The letter was an invitation to a fancy dress party. Mr. Ben wasn't really very fond of parties, but he did like fancy dress. He put on his hat and coat and set out to search the shops for something special to wear. He tried the big shops didn't find anything. He tried the not-so-big shops. Still, he didn't find anything. He tried the small shops in the side streets. Everywhere, it was the same story. No fancy dress, only ordinary, everyday clothes. But at last, in a back lane, he found a little shop with all sorts of interesting things to wear. In the window was a suit of bright red armour. Mr. Ben went into the shop. As if by magic, the shopkeeper appeared. Can I help you, sir? he asked. After looking quickly round the shop, Mr. Ben said, I wonder if I might borrow that suit of red armour. The man seemed pleased. Of course, he said. Would you like to see if it fits? And he pointed to the door of the fitting room. Mr. Ben carried the armour through the door and found he was in a small room. Quickly, he changed into the armour. He smiled at the red knight reflected in the mirror. He laughed. Then he noticed another door. Well, said Mr. Ben, and he walked through the second doorway. Instead of another room, Mr. Ben found himself in rocky countryside. From behind a large pile of rocks, he could see smoke rising. Feeling brave in his red armour, he walked over to see what was making the smoke. He climbed the rocks and found the smoke was coming from a dragon, quite a large dragon. Gosh, thought Mr. Ben, somebody else in fancy dress, and he called down. Hello, that's a good outfit. How do you make the smoke? The dragon looked up. You can't fool me, he said. I know you've been sent to kill me. Kill him, thought Mr. Ben. And he realised that it was a real dragon. A sad, very sad dragon. Before long, Mr. Ben was sitting down with the dragon, and the dragon told Mr. Ben his story. The dragon had lived happily in a castle, 
He worked hard, lighting fires for all the people who lived nearby. Everybody loved him, especially the king. One day, a man came to the castle with a new idea for lighting fires, which he called a match. Nobody wanted matches. They had a dragon to light their fires. But the matchmaker was cunning. He set fire to a barn or two and saw that the dragon got the blame. He caused so much trouble that the poor dragon was made to leave the castle. Then everybody had to go to the matchmaker and buy matches. To make matters worse, the king's favourite white horse had run away at the same time, and the dragon had been blamed for this as well. He was being blamed for everything. The dragon pointed to the horse which stood nearby. I've been looking after him, said the dragon, but I'm much too afraid to return him. I'll help you, said Mr Ben. Show me where the castle is and I'll tell the king the true story. The dragon was delighted and they left almost at once. After they'd walked quite a way, the dragon stopped. There in the distance, Mr Ben could see the castle. The dragon was afraid to go any closer. Um, I'll wait here under the trees until you return, he said. Mr. Ben said, goodbye, and rode off towards the castle. castle, the guard saw Mr. Ben approaching. They rushed to the king and told him that a brave red knight must have killed the dragon because he was returning the white horse. Mr. Ben arrived at the castle. He didn't have to say anything, he was taken straight to the king to be rewarded. <laughs> King listened while Mr. Ben told him the dragon's story. The king had missed the dragon and was delighted to hear the truth. Nobody liked the nasty matchmaker. He was making his matches more and more expensive because he knew that people had to have them. The matchmaker was brought to the king. The king ordered him to prison until he thought how to punish the rascal. The guards took him to the deepest, darkest dungeon. Mr. Ben led the way for the king and his guard to welcome the dragon back. They stopped before they reached the dragon's hiding place, in case they frightened the dragon. The king and the red knight walked to the trees. The king told the dragon how sorry he was for all the dragon's troubles, and how happy he was to see him again. The dragon was so happy that he made Mr. Ben and the king ride on his back. With the dragon leading the way, and the guard following, they returned to the castle.
Everybody came to the castle to welcome the dragon back, and the king made a speech. He explained how the matchmaker had caused all the trouble, not the dragon. He said that matches were better for most people, and that everyone could have the matches they needed free. The matchmaker would make the matches for nothing, as his punishment. The dragon would be the king's personal firelighter. Then the king said they would have a feast, and the red knight would be the guest of honour. Everybody started to get things ready for the feast. Mr. Ben just stood at the side and watched. A man appeared nearby. And Mr. Ben wondered where he'd seen him before. Would you like to change for the feast, sir? The man asked. And he took Mr. Ben to a nearby door. You'll find the other clothes inside, sir, he said. As he stepped through the door, Mr. Ben found he was back in the changing room of the shop. He took a last look at the Red Knight in the mirror, and he changed into his own clothes again. Then he went back into the shop. Mr. Ben had had enough excitement. He didn't want to go to the fancy dress party now. Thank you, he said to the shopkeeper as he gave back the armour. I won't take it with me after all. The little man smiled. Right you are, sir. Shall we be seeing you again? Oh, yes. I'll be back, said Mr. Ben from the door. Very soon, he added. As he walked back down Festive Road, Mr. Ben thought about his adventure. When he went to get his front door key out, he found an unusual box of matches in his pocket. He smiled at the picture on the box. How nice, he thought. I'll keep them carefully, just to remind me. Mr. Ben looked out of his window at number 52 Festive Road. It was a very ordinary street. Not a lot was happening. Mr. Leslie was showing some plants to Mr. John. 
ladies were talking. And young Vicky was being scolded for chasing a cat. Mr. Ben smiled and decided to go for a walk. He went in from the window and soon appeared at the front door wearing his hat and coat. At first, Mr. Ben walked in the park at the end of the road. He sat for a while and watched the birds in the trees. And dogs who seemed to be taking their owners for walks. Next, he wandered among the shops. He looked in a pet shop window. Nearby was a florist's. Mr. Ben looked in there as well. As he walked on, he recognized the lane which he'd strolled into. It was the lane with the unusual costume shop, the shop which adventures could start from. stood outside for a moment and then went in. As if by magic, the shopkeeper appeared. Good morning, sir. How good to see you again. Can I help you? He asked. Mr. Ben looked around the shop. Everything seems to have been animals and plants this morning, he said. What's in keeping with that? How about this, sir? Asked the shopkeeper and stepped over to a khaki-coloured outfit. A hunter? asked Mr. Ben. Not a bad idea. May I see if it fits? He looked at the door of the fitting room and wondered if another adventure would start from there. Mr. Ben took the outfit and went into the fitting room. He was soon changed and he looked at himself in the mirror. After Mr. Ben had admired himself in his new clothes, he looked for the door. Not the one that he'd come through, but the other door, which might lead to an adventure. Without waiting, Mr. Ben walked through. Outside the door, Mr. Ben found himself in an open space in the jungle. Nearby stood another man dressed like Mr. Ben. As soon as he saw Mr. Ben, he called out impatiently to him, Ah, there you are. I suppose you're my new assistant. Now, come on, pick up my things and let's get started. Mr. Ben was worried by the hunter's gun and was determined to stop him shooting anything. But he did as he was told and they started to walk through the jungle. As they walked, Mr. Ben's new companion did all the talking. He boasted and boasted how good he was at hunting and shooting. You're very lucky to be with me, he said to Mr. Ben. I must be the greatest big game hunter that ever lived. I'll show you. He took his rifle from Mr. Ben and pointed it at a little bird that sat nearby. Mr. Ben was quite worried for the bird and said, uh, Surely, if you're so good, you don't bother with little birds. What? Uh, oh, no, oh, no, of course not, said the hunter. They walked on, and the hunter pretending that he hadn't really intended to shoot the bird. A little later, they saw a snake. As soon as Mr. Ben saw the hunter start to raise his rifle, he said, I don't suppose you bother with snakes either. Ahem, <laughs> laughed the hunter. Uh, certainly not. I was just, uh, I was just trying the sights, he added. They walked on and came to a hill with a deer standing on it. Now there is something to shoot, said the hunter. No, no, said Mr. Ben. We'll find something larger in a minute. And he hurried the hunter away.
For a while, they stood by a river. Mr. Ben was glad that the hunter was content to watch the fish without wanting to shoot them. Across the river, Mr. Ben saw a crocodile. There's a crocodile over there, but uh, let's wait for a larger animal, he said. The hunter never even started to raise his rifle. Next, it was a lion standing quietly outside its cave. Not large enough, said Mr. Ben, and they left the lion in peace. After that, it was a giraffe. Tall, said Mr. Ben, um, but not really fat enough for the greatest big game hunter. Perhaps not said the hunter, and didn't bother to shoot. By now, both the hunter and Mr. Ben were hungry. They sat down in an open space to eat. While they were eating, a hippo wandered by. The hunter wanted to get his rifle. Stop, called Mr. Ben. I know that hippo is big, but he's not the biggest animal, and only the biggest is good enough for the greatest hunter. Right, said the hunter and they finished their lunch. The hunter wanted a little nap after lunch, and while he slept, Mr. Ben decided to have a stroll. He wanted to think. So far, he'd saved the animals, but how would it all end? As he walked, he felt the ground shake under his feet. The further he walked, the more it shook. In the end, it shook so much that Mr. Ben fell over. Then Mr. Ben could see a herd of elephants all shaking with fear. Mr. Ben managed to calm them enough to be able to stand up again. You've saved the other animals, but we're the largest. We're certain to be shot, said one of the elephants. I've been thinking, said Mr. Ben. You've just helped me find the answer. Listen to my idea. The hunter was just waking as Mr. Ben arrived back and was eager to get on with the hunt. Mr. Ben led the way and they marched deeper and deeper into the jungle. Mr. Ben pretending all the time to search for animals as he went. to a clearing and stopped. There stood the whole herd of elephants. Just the thing, said Mr. Ben. The largest animals for the greatest big game hunter. The hunter was delighted and raised his rifle, ready to shoot. At that moment, Mr. Ben sat down. That was the signal for the elephants. They jumped up and down for all they were worth. The ground shook and shook and shook. The hunter didn't have a chance. Every shot he fired went into the ground or into the air. Eventually, all his shots were fired and the elephants, untouched, walked quietly away. Mr. Ben pretended to be disgusted. Call yourself a great hunter. If you can't hit a huge elephant, you can't hit anything. You're not safe with a rifle. Then more kindly, he said, why don't you sell the rifle and buy a camera? At least if you missed, you'd still get a picture of something. Mr. Ben and the hunter 
return to the hunter's camp. There, believe it or not, was a man selling cameras. Mr. Ben smiled. He thought he recognized the salesman. Put the things in the tent and help us choose a camera, Mr. Ben was told. Mr. Ben stepped into the tent, and as he did so, he found he'd stepped back into the changing room of the shop. There on the floor were his own clothes. He changed back into them. Mr. Ben went back into the shop and returned the hunter's outfit. I never did help choose a camera, he said. No, but judging by this, he chose well, sir, said the shopkeeper. And he gave Mr. Ben a photograph. May I keep it, asked Mr. Ben. Certainly, said the shopkeeper. As Mr. Ben left the shop, he turned and said, Thank you. I'll be back to see you again soon. Mr. Ben had enjoyed his adventure, but he was happy to be back in Festive Road. At his gate, he smiled as he pulled out the photograph and looked at it. I'll always keep it, he thought, just to help me remember. It was another quiet morning in Festive Road. At number 52, Mr. Ben thought he heard some laughter and he looked out of his window. He saw Karen juggling with three balls. A boy balancing. Then he saw the group of children who were laughing. In the middle, was Julian, wearing a funny mask. Mr. Ben watched for a while and then decided to go for a walk. Mr. Ben was on his way to the special costume shop, the shop which adventures could start from. Inside the shop, he stood and looked at the strange costumes and at once saw the one that made him laugh. As if by magic, the shopkeeper appeared. Good morning, he said. Would you like to try on the clown suit, sir? Mr. Ben said that he would love to, and taking the clown's clothes, he went to the door in the corner of the shop, the door of the fitting room. Once in the room, he changed from his own clothes
He didn't spend a long time looking at himself, but turned to the other door of the fitting room, the one which could lead to adventures. Mr. Ben walked through the door, wondering if he would come into a circus ring. <laughs> To his surprise, he found himself in an open landscape beside a little car. He knew at once that the car was for him. It could only be a clown's car. Before long, Mr. Ben was driving the car gently along the road. Everything was going very smoothly until Mr. Ben was about to go round a bend. Then the car started to behave very oddly. At the same time, Mr. Ben could see a long line of trucks parked along the road in front of him, brightly painted circus trucks. There was just room for the clown's car to drive past. At the front of the queue of trucks stood all the circus people with their backs to Mr. Ben. The little car made such a din that everybody turned to look. The car stopped with a bang. And Mr. Ben fell out. Everybody laughed. They made Mr. Ben feel quite welcome and they asked him to help them with the circus for a while. If we ever get to the next town, said a voice, and everybody became quiet again and turned to look the other way. For the first time, Mr. Ben saw why they were all stopped. A bridge they should have crossed had fallen down and they couldn't go on. The circus folk were beginning to argue about the bridge. The strong man wanted to fill the gap with huge stones. The others told him it would only stop the river flowing. The tightrope walker wanted to put a rope across and balance everything over. But they'd never manage with the elephants. The conjurer said that he could make pieces of wood and stones balance for them to cross, but nobody thought that that would be safe. Everybody was suggesting things which they did in their circus acts. The stilt man wanted to make extra long stilts for everyone, but that wouldn't get trucks or equipment across. What do you think we should do? asked the ringmaster. Well, said Mr. Ben, you all work together to make a good circus. Well, I think you should all work together to make a good bridge. They all agreed. When the wood started to arrive, the ringmaster asked how they should build it. If we build it on the side, we can make sure it's strong enough, said Mr. Ben. Then we can gradually slide it into place. But surely, said the ringmaster, it'll fall in the gap before it reaches the other side. Build the bridge longer than we need it. The extra will balance it. The bridge was started and gradually began to be pushed across the gap. It would be very useful to have someone on the other side to help it into place, said Mr. Ben. The circus cowboy, who did rope tricks, used his lasso. He threw it and fastened it onto the rock on the other side of the gap, pulled it tight and fixed it. The tightrope walker had no trouble in getting across. Then the trapeze artist went over as well. All this time, more wood was being brought and the bridge went on growing and growing.
The stilts man put on his longest stilts and stood down in the gap to help the bridge over. So the work went on building onto the road end of the bridge and then everyone pushing the bridge further across. At last, it reached the other side. Everyone had played their part and the bridge was a success. The first person to cross the bridge was Mr. Ben in his little car, still playing its tricks. Then came the whole circus procession. The trucks, the elephants, horses, everything. Once across the bridge, the procession continued happily to the next town, where they were going to put up the big top, the circus tent. The circus started with the parade of the stars. Mr. Ben, of course, drove his little car. The first act was a balancing act. Mr. Ben loved it when lots of things were balanced, one on top of the other. The second act was a magician who suddenly appeared. He looked very familiar, but Mr. Ben couldn't remember seeing him at the bridge. The magician made a ball disappear from under one box and appear under another. Then he held up a vase of flowers and made that completely vanish. Next, said the magician, I would like to make a real person vanish. And he asked for someone to help him. <laughs> Mr. Ben drove into the ring. The audience laughed. The magician pointed to a large box. Step into there, sir, and you will vanish, he said. Mr. Ben stepped into the box. And just as he expected, he found that he'd stepped back into the changing room of the shop. He took a last look at himself in his clown's clothes and then changed back into his own things. Back in the shop, Mr. Ben returned the clothes. You're a good magician, he said to the shopkeeper. We can all do something, sir, smiled the man. Mr. Ben was about to go when he remembered he still had the red nose. I nearly forgot, he said. That's all right, sir, said the man. Perhaps you'd like to keep it. Thank you, said Mr. Ben. Back in Festive Road, Everything was quiet, with people going about their business. There was just one group of children, balancing on stilts and laughing. At his door, Mr. Ben took the red nose from his pocket and thought of the shopkeeper. How kind, he thought. It's just what I needed to help me remember.
Above Festive Road, which is very ordinary and happy, clouds were drifting gently. In Festive Road, things were moving not quite so gently. Children were blowing up balloons, and instead of tying the ends, they were letting the balloons go, so they rushed about until all the air was out of them. At his gate, Mr. Ben stood and watched the games. Then he looked up at the clouds. How gentle and free they look, he thought. Then he thought that it was time that he paid another visit to that special costume shop which his adventures could start from. He started to look around the shop when, as if by magic, the shopkeeper appeared. Good morning, sir, he said. How nice to see you again. What would you like to try on today? What about this one? said Mr. Ben. Good, said the man. See if it fits. And he looked towards the door of the fitting room in the corner of the shop. In the little room, Mr. Ben soon changed from his clothes into the other outfit. He stopped and admired himself in the mirror of the changing room but not for long. He was too eager to go through the other door of the changing room, the door that would lead to... To what this time, wondered Mr. Ben? This time, Mr. Ben found he'd walked into a crowd of people. Wondering what the crowd was watching, he gradually managed to work his way to the front. There stood six balloons in a line, very large, decorated balloons with baskets hanging underneath for people to stand in. The balloons had two men in each basket. But the one nearest to Mr. Ben had just one young man. So he asked the young man what was happening. It's a balloon race, said the young man. We're all going to race to the next town. I would love to win, but it's very difficult against a cheat. Who cheats? asked Mr. Ben. Wicked Baron Bartram, the man with a tall hat in the next balloon. Mr. Ben asked why the young man was alone. My friend suddenly had to go, said the young man. I think Baron Bartram tricked him to make it more difficult for me. Can I ride with you? asked Mr. Ben. The young man was pleased, and Mr. Ben was soon in the basket of the balloon and was told how the balloon worked. When we want to go up, we pull in the anchor. To come down, we let some of the gas out of the balloon from this tube at the bottom. Mr. Ben looked at the other balloons. Apart from the young man's and the baron's, they all had extra bits on. One had two sails. The next had oars to row in the air. The third had a large kite to pull it. The fourth had a large propeller. I couldn't afford any extra bits, said the young man. Anyway, I don't trust Baron Bartram. I'm sure he's done something to the other balloon so that he can win. Just then, there was a shout from the man who was going to start the race. He held a pistol above his head. What shall I do? asked Mr. Ben. When he fires the starting pistol, pull in the anchor rope, said the young man. On your marks, called the starter. Get set. Go. <laughs> Quickly, each balloon crew pulled in their anchor. Mr. Ben pulled his in. The balloon started to rise, 
then stopped. He looked over the side and he noticed the balloon had been tied to the drain pipe of a cottage. I bet that was Baron Bartram, he said. He gave a hard tug on the rope and part of the drain pipe came up with the rope. We'll return it later, said Mr. Ben. It was the Baron, all right. Look at the other balloons. He's tried to stop us all. The first had lost one of its sails and the balloon was spinning around in circles. On the second, Baron Bartram must have covered the oars with bird seed. The oars were lined with birds, so many that the balloon was weighed down by them. The kite was pulling the next one more up than along and the balloon was vanishing into the clouds. On the fourth, Bartram must have turned the propeller back to front. The balloon shot off at speed, but in the wrong direction. Baron Bartram, grinning and waving, was drifting on his way. He became a bit annoyed when he saw that the young man was not so far behind as he'd expected him to be. The two balloons drifted on. The crowds were left behind and they passed over open country. Slowly, they caught up Baron Bartram's balloon and then passed it. Mr. Ben loved the gentle movement. This, he thought, is how the clouds must feel. They passed over a small wood and then noticed that as Bartram was about to cross it, he lowered a rope. The man with Bartram raised a horn to his mouth and gave a blast on it. From out of the woods galloped a horse and rider. The rider grabbed the end of the rope and tied it to the saddle. Once the rope was fixed, the horse galloped off, pulling the balloon at a much faster pace. The young man and Mr. Ben had gone well ahead, but now they were being caught up again. As Bartram passed, he gave a wicked grin and called, Bad luck, but you don't really think I'd let you win, do you? The young man watched Bartram get ahead and said, There's nothing we can do now. Perhaps there is, said Mr. Ben, and he picked up the piece of drain pipe that had snapped off at the start of the race. He fixed one end of the pipe against the place where the gas could be let out and pointed the other end behind them. Some gas was let out and the balloon shot forward and then slowed again. Again, said Mr. Ben. The only thing is, said the young man, as the gas is let out, we will go down as well as along. We've nearly caught them. Keep trying. An extra strong blast from the balloon sent it rushing along, but getting lower. They shot past the Baron and gave the horse a fright. It reared in the air, threw off the rider, and then rushed away, taking Baron Bartram's balloon in the wrong direction. Their troubles were over. The balloon was quite low, but it drifted along just above the trees. Finally, with a gentle bump, it landed at the finishing post to win the race. The crowd cheered loudly. The mayor presented the young man with a gold cup and the prize money. And then he looked for the medal for Mr. Ben for helping. I must have left it inside, he said. A man suddenly appeared beside Mr. Ben. 
I'll take you inside to get it. This way, sir. Mr. Ben stepped through the door and at once recognised the changing room of the shop. There were his own clothes. He took a last look at himself in the mirror and changed. Back in the shop, he gave back the clothes. Thank you, sir, said the shopkeeper. And then smiling, I believe this is yours. And he held out a medal to Mr. Ben. Mr. Ben was delighted. At the door, he waved and said, thank you. See you soon. Mr. Ben was quite happy to be back in Festive Road with his feet on the ground. The boys were still playing with balloons, which now were tied up and just drifting. At his door, Mr. Ben took another look at the medal. It had a picture of a balloon with a large number one on it. I'll keep it with my other souvenirs, he said. It'll help me remember. Something was happening in Festive Road. It was just another morning, but all along this ordinary street, children and their mothers were walking in one direction. At number 52, Mr. Ben looked out of his window and noticed what was happening. They're all going towards the park at the end of the road, he thought. I wonder why. He went in from his window, put on his hat and coat, and was soon on his way to find out what was happening. In the park, he could see the children and parents standing together. On some mornings in the park, a little show was put on for the children. This was one of those mornings. Mr. Ben decided to stay and watch the show. First, it was Punch and Judy. Children loved it. So did Mr. Ben. Next, it was a magician. He was very good. He held up a bunch of flowers and made them change to a bird. He made the bird change to a goldfish in a bowl. And then back again. After the show was over, Mr. Ben sat on a park bench and thought what fun it would be to work magic and he thought of a certain set of clothes he could remember seeing in the special clothes shop where he knew adventures could start from. He looked around the shop until he saw the costume which he'd remembered. As if by magic, the shopkeeper appeared. Good morning, sir, he said. Have you seen anything you fancy? Uh, this one, he said. It was a strangely decorated outfit with a pointed hat. May I see if it fits, he asked. You know where the fitting room is, sir, said the shopkeeper. And they both looked towards the door in the corner of the shop. 
Mr. Ben was soon in the fitting room. He changed from his ordinary clothes. And admired himself in the mirror of the room. I think this is a wizard's outfit, thought Mr. Ben. Now where will that take me? Then he went through the other door, the one that could lead to adventures. Once through the door, Mr. Ben found himself in a kind of cave. There were lots of shelves loaded with books, bottles, jars and packets. Mr. Ben picked up a book called Useful Spells and started to read it. It said that most spells in the book needed chalk to draw a sign, magic spell powder and a wand. Mr. Ben was just wondering which spell to try when there was a ring on a bell and in walked two men. We've come from the palace, said one. We've been sent to find a wizard. Would you come with us? We need your help. Mr. Ben said he would, but he felt a bit worried because he hadn't had time to try out any magic yet. Outside the cave, a horse-drawn carriage was waiting to take them to the palace. They climbed into it and were soon on their way. As they drove along, people beside the road stopped what they were doing to wave. Everybody seems happy, said Mr. Ben. They are, said the messenger. It's a very happy kingdom. The king is very good. Everybody loves him. Why does the king want me? asked Mr. Ben. You'll find out in a minute, said the messenger. We're nearly there. The coach drove up to the palace and stopped at the entrance. Mr. Ben was taken to the great hall. Lots of people stood around. Mr. Ben thought they looked rather worried. At the end of the hall sat the king and queen. The queen looked very queenly. The king looked just a short, round, happy man. Mr. Ben bowed to the king and queen. The queen began to explain what she wanted. First, she told Mr. Ben how good the king was and how he kept his people happy. The trouble is, said the queen, he just sits and grins. He's not lively enough for a king. He should jump about a bit more. Can you make him? Jump about more, said Mr. Ben, and he looked in his book of spells. He found a spell that seemed right, and he read it carefully. He took his chalk and drew a sign round the king's throne. Next, he sprinkled some magic powder on the king, read out the magic spell, pointed his wand, and the king jumped and jumped, rather like a large frog. Stop, shouted the queen, and luckily Mr. Ben was ready with the spell to change things back again. The queen wanted to try again. A king should be big and strong, she said. Make him big and strong. Mr. Ben read the book again, made another sign, sprinkled more dust, and pointed his wand. And the king grew and he smashed through the throne, which he thought was very funny. He gave the nearest guard a friendly pat. It was such a blow that it sent the guards flying like a line of skittles. The king bumped a pillar, and that too came tumbling down. Stop, shouted the queen, before he smashes the palace. Again a flash, and the king at his throne, and the soldiers, and the pillar were back to normal. Strength may not be good, said the queen, but look at him. Can't he be tall and elegant? 
Oh, I'll try, said Mr. Ben, and read again, did what it said, and... <laughs> said the Queen. Mr. Ben was already saying the spell. I have it, said the Queen. I would like the King to look like that. And she pointed to a statue. Mr. Ben read, marked, sprinkled, pointed and... There was the king, just like the statue. The queen was delighted, until she realised the king was just stone. Oh dear, said the queen, this is no good, change him back. Mr Ben had had enough. He liked the king. Everybody liked the king, even the queen liked the king. She just wanted him to look different. Mr Ben told the queen that things couldn't be changed to and fro forever. Oh, please try, said the queen. I realise now it's what he is that matters, not how he looks. If I do, said Mr Ben, you must never try to change him again. I won't, I promise, just get him back, said the Queen. With a flash, <laughs> Mr Ben brought the King back. Everybody cheered Mr Ben. Mr Ben thought they all seemed very happy, seeing that everything was just as it had been. The king, still laughing, thanked Mr. Ben. Another man appeared nearby. If you come with me, sir, I'll take you back, he said to Mr. Ben. But the king called to Mr. Ben before he could go. I say, Mr. Wizard, I love those flashes you made. Could we have some more before you go? Mr. Ben was delighted. He used the last of his magic dust and did a show of flashes for everyone. After that, Mr. Ben said goodbye and went through the door the man had shown him. He found himself back in the changing room of the shop. He took a last look at himself as a wizard in the mirror. And then put on his own clothes. Back in the shop, he returned the wizard's outfit and said, I like that king. I'm glad he wasn't changed. Thanks to you, said the shopkeeper. And then, by the way, the jar that held the magic dust is empty now, but you might like to have it. Oh, thank you. I would, said Mr. Ben. And he waved from the door. See you again soon. Back in Festive Road, Mr. Ben was happy. It's a very ordinary street, he thought but I'm glad it hasn't changed. At his gate, he smiled at his jar. Yes, it's empty, but it's just the thing to help me remember. I'll keep it always.
It was another ordinary day in Festive Road. Boys played with toy rockets while their mothers brought home the shopping. Number 52 is Mr. Ben's house, but Mr. Ben was nowhere in sight. He was in the back garden, talking to his neighbour. Why is it, asked the neighbour, that your grass always looks greener than mine? Oh, that's strange, said Mr. Ben. I always thought yours looked greener than mine, and they both laughed. Mr. Ben soon appeared at his front door, wearing his hat and coat. And shortly after, he was walking in the park. Mr. Ben sat on a park bench and looked around. He saw a boy flying a kite. It went so high, it seemed to be reaching the clouds. I wonder if it would go above the clouds if the string was long enough, thought Mr. Ben. It would be interesting to go above the clouds. Mr. Ben suddenly tingled with excitement. He remembered the costume shop which adventures could start from. And in almost no time, he was in the lane of the special shop. For once, he hardly paused, but went straight in. As if by magic, the shopkeeper appeared. Good morning, sir, he said. I do believe you have made up your mind already. Yes, please, said Mr. Ben. I would like to try the space outfit. You know the way, sir, said the shopkeeper. And they both looked towards the door of the changing room where Mr. Ben would try on the outfit. Mr. Ben was soon in the changing room and quickly took off his clothes and put on the space outfit. He looked at himself in the mirror. Then he looked for the other door, the door that always led to adventures. Mr. Ben didn't hesitate. He walked straight through the second doorway and found himself inside a spaceship. At the controls was another spaceman. Hello, he said. Ready for the blast off? Here we go then. And Mr. Ben felt the spacecraft start off. Mr. Ben watched the stars through the window. Where are we going, he asked. To a planet covered with gold and jewels. We'll be rich, said the spaceman. That could be fun, thought Mr. Ben. Later, the other spaceman spoke again. Nearly there, you can see the planet. Mr. Ben could see a planet which was very close. Hmm, it looks very ordinary, but it must be very special, with all the gold and jewels lying there, he thought. The spaceship landed with a gentle bump. Mr. Ben followed the spaceman down the ladder and looked around. Just as the spaceman had said, there were lumps of gold and jewels just lying there. We are rich, said the spaceman, and it wasn't long before he and Mr. Ben were walking around with their arms full of gold and jewels, looking for even better pieces to carry. They walked around a rock and met a man, dressed in rags, sitting on a large lump of gold. Hello, said the man. What are you going to do with all that that you're carrying? The spaceman laughed. We're rich. We can do anything we like with it. I'm afraid you're wrong, said the ragged man. It's, it's no good to you at all. 
There are no shops on this planet, so there's nowhere to spend the riches. And as soon as you take the gold and jewels away from this planet, they turn into ordinary stone. This planet is useless. The next planet is the place to be. There they live in comfort, food, clothes. Everything is free. In that case, we, we may as well go, said the spaceman. In fact, let's go to the next planet. And without their riches, they went back to the spaceship. Mr. Ben kept one piece of gold to see how it looked after it had changed. The spaceship flew away from the planet and sped on its way. There it is, said the spaceman, as another planet appeared very close. It was not long before the spaceship had landed and the two men were looking around the planet. They had landed near a town. The shops were full of things and nobody looked poor. The restaurants had tables outside where people sat and ate and everything was free. Mr. Ben and the spaceman sat down at a table. Gradually they realized what was wrong with the place. Apart from Mr. Ben and his friend, everything was dull. When the waiter came, they asked him about this dullness. Well, sir, he said, there's no colour here at all. And if you stay here very long, you'll be just like us. Then he told them of another planet where everything was very bright. Come on, said the spaceman, let's go there. I don't fancy a life without colour. They were soon back in the spaceship. Mr. Ben stood and watched the spaceman as they left the grey planet. Once again, the spaceship travelled among the stars. When they came closer to the next planet, Mr. Ben began to wonder if it would be as perfect as they'd hoped. We'll have a good look round first, said the spaceman. We won't even get out if we see anything wrong. Once they'd landed, they looked out of every window of the spaceship. Everything looked all right. Colourful birds flew past. There were bright flowers and trees. Painted houses and brightly dressed people. They even looked through telescopes to make sure. The only unusual thing they could see were the hats that everyone wore down over their ears. Just a fashion, said the spaceman. Let's go outside. Once outside, they realised the hats were not just fashion. Everyone had their ears covered because the noise was so terrible. Mr Ben and the spaceman ran back to the spaceship. When they were on their way, the spaceman said, I'm lost. We'll have to stop at the next planet we pass and ask the way. And before long, they landed once more. This planet was very hot, too hot, but at least it was quiet enough to be able to talk. At first there was nobody in sight, but suddenly, as if by magic, a man appeared. Mr. Ben smiled, for he recognised the shopkeeper. The spaceman explained to the shopkeeper that they were lost. He also told him about all the places where they'd been. Now where do we go, he asked. The shopkeeper told them of a place which was not perfect, but then he didn't have so much wrong with it either. We'll try there, said the spaceman and started to leave. 
Um, I think I'll stay here, said Mr. Ben. I've had enough travelling. He watched the spaceman leave and waved goodbye. It's very hot, sir. Step into the cave and keep cool, said the shopkeeper. Mr. Ben went into the cave, and as he'd expected, he found that he was back in the changing room of the shop. He took a last look at himself as a spaceman, and then changed into his own clothes. Mr. Ben went into the shop and returned the outfit. Where did you send the spaceman, he asked. Here, sir, back to Earth. It's not perfect, but it's not too bad either, said the shopkeeper. Back in Festive Road, people went about their business as usual. At his gate, Mr. Ben stopped and from his pocket took out a lump of stone. Nobody would believe that this was once gold, he thought. But I'll always keep it, then at least I will remember. festive road was quiet. There was nobody about at all. A van appeared. It stopped by the pavement and sounded a tune. At number 52, Mr. Ben looked out of his window. The street, which had been empty, was now alive with children. The van was an ice cream van, and the children queued for their ice creams. For a while, Mr. Ben watched. Then he went in from the window. By the time Mr. Ben came to his front door, wearing his hat and coat, the van had gone. Mr. Ben went for a walk. His walk took him to a special costume shop, a shop that adventures could start from. Inside the shop, as if by magic, the shopkeeper appeared. Good morning, sir, he said. Which costume would you like to try today? This one, said Mr. Ben, and pointed to the white clothes of a cook. In no time, he had taken the outfit into the changing room. Mr. Ben changed into the cook's clothes. 
and smiled at himself in the mirror. Then he went through the door that always led him to an adventure. Outside the door, Mr. Ben found himself beside some children. They were thin and their clothes just rags. Mr. Ben was in a dingy back street. He walked along the street and saw other children just as poor as the first ones. After a while, Mr. Ben turned into a side street. In the street were other cooks, all talking about going to the palace. Mr. Ben followed them. The cooks walked past the palace guards. through the palace doors. Finally, they came to a huge kitchen where other cooks were already busy. The king's servant spoke to the new cooks. In the other room is the princess Annabella. She will not eat, she just refuses. We want you to cook something that will make her want to eat. We've tried all these. And he pointed to food arranged on a table. Now, get to work. Mr. Ben stood back and watched the other cooks. They fetched, poured, roasted, pounded, iced, boiled and tasted for all they were worth. Each cook made his favorite food. As soon as one was ready, everyone would stop what they were doing. The cook was proudly led off, carrying his food. But before long, the cook, still carrying the food, would return, looking very sad, because the princess would not eat it. The others would go back to their fetching, pouring, roasting, pounding, icing, boiling, tasting and so on until another cook was ready to take his food to the princess. But the princess did not eat it. On the table, the pile of food grew and grew and grew. But still the princess would not eat. As the next cook went in, Mr. Ben found a place where he could peep through into the other room. In the other room was a long table. At the far end of it sat a worried-looking king and a worried-looking queen and a princess who didn't seem to be interested in anything. Then another cook came through the door. The king and the queen said things like, Oh, how lovely. Doesn't that look nice, Annabella? Now eat up if you want to be beautiful like your mummy. After which Annabella said, No. The king looked at the queen. The queen looked at the servant, the servant looked at the cook, and they all looked at Annabella. 
The cook picked up the food and carried it away. Back in the kitchen, the servant said, What shall we do? We've tried apples, bacon, cake, doughnuts, Easter eggs, fish fingers, and everything else we can think of. She just won't eat. Um, there's nothing wrong with the food, said Mr. Ben. I have an idea if the king will let me try it. The king didn't even wait to hear the idea. He said, yes, anything, just get her to eat. Mr. Ben ran out of the palace. Back in the kitchen, the cooks prepared more food and laid the long table for a feast and then prepared even more food. Mr. Ben went back to the dingy street he'd seen before. He called the hungry children together and said, you're all invited to a feast at the palace. Ask your parents if you can come and meet me back here. Later, Mr. Ben returned to the palace with the children. passed through the palace entrance and along the corridors until they reached the room where the feast was. Mr. Ben said, children, help yourselves. They didn't have to be asked twice. like the other children. Mr. Ben's plan had worked. The princess turned to the king. Daddy, she said, can they come back again next week? Of course, dear, said the king. They can come back every week. suddenly appeared beside Mr. Ben and said, Would you take this back to the kitchen for me, please? And he gave Mr. Ben a wooden spoon. Mr. Ben did as he was asked, but as he went through the door, instead of the kitchen, he found himself back in the changing room of the shop. He took a last look at himself as a cook and then changed. Back in the shop, Mr. Ben returned the cook's outfit. Um, what shall I do with this wooden spoon? he asked. You can keep that, sir, said the shopkeeper. Thank you, said Mr. Ben. I, I hoped you'd say that. From the door, he waved goodbye. 
back in Festive Road, the usual street things were going on. The children there didn't look hungry. At his gate, Mr. Ben remembered the wooden spoon in his pocket. He smiled and thought, I'll keep it safely with my other souvenirs. Festive road is usually very quiet, but on this morning, the street was crowded with traffic. At number 52, Mr. Ben looked out of his window at all the traffic. What's going on? He asked a man. The main road is being repaired, and it's the rush hour, said the man. All the traffic has to come this way. Mr. Ben went back inside and sat down to watch television. The television was showing a film about cavemen. It said that cavemen lived a long time ago. They lived in caves. That's why they were called cavemen. They dressed in furs and worked with tools made out of stone. Mr. Ben was interested in the program but the traffic outside was so noisy, he couldn't really hear the television. I must get away from all this noise, he said. And he thought about the special costume shop that he knew, the shop that adventures could start from. That's the place to go, he smiled. Mr. Ben was soon in the lane with the shop. He went straight to it, paused for a moment, and then went in. He waited inside the shop, looking at the costumes. Something away from cars, he thought. As if by magic, the shopkeeper appeared. Good morning, sir, he said. Good morning, sir, Mr. Ben. Is that a caveman's outfit? Yes, said the shopkeeper. You know, they used to live in caves. They didn't have houses. They didn't have any cars either, said Mr. Ben. Do you think I might try it on? He took the fur into the fitting room. Once inside the fitting room, he quickly changed. He smiled at the furry Mr. Ben in the mirror and then went through the door that could lead to an adventure. On the other side of the door, everything was very dark, but Mr. Ben could see a light ahead and he walked towards it. As it became lighter, he found that he was walking out of a cave. In front of him were other caves and lots of people dressed in furs. <music> Mr. 
Mr. Ben went over to a patch of grass and lay down. He closed his eyes and thought how peaceful it was. The sun was shining and he wondered why the cave people didn't lie out in it. It wasn't long before he knew why. From a long way off came a rumbling noise. At the same time, the people at the caves started to shout. In the distance was a great cloud of dust coming closer and closer. The cavemen were shouting, Look out! Get out of the way! Run for it! Mr. Ben jumped to his feet and raced back to the caves, just as a huge animal thundered past. Dolly, said Mr. Ben. What was that? A dinosaur, said a man. Every morning, the dinosaurs and other animals rush past here on their way to get the best feeding places. And now, in the evening, they race back to get the best places to sleep. Suddenly, there was a crash and the dinosaurs screeched to a halt. Some of the dinosaurs had fallen over, blocking the road. <gasps> That's always happening, said the man. They're so impatient, no manners at all. The dinosaurs picked themselves up and rushed off again. The cave people settled down to a meal. Mr. Ben asked, why do you stay here? There must be other places to live away from these dinosaurs. Not with caves, said a man, and we need caves to live in. When the meal was over, everyone went to their own caves to sleep. And Mr. Ben settled himself under a pile of furs for the night. The next morning, when Mr. Ben woke up, he heard shouting outside the cave. He looked out and saw some men trying to move a dinosaur. Can I help? asked Mr. Ben. This often happens, explained a man. An animal just parks here to sleep and blocks a cave entrance so that people can't get out. Help us push it out of the way, will you? <coughs> When Mr. Ben was having his breakfast, he heard the rumbling noise again. This time, he knew what to expect. The animals went rushing past, but this time in the opposite direction. When all the dinosaurs had gone, Mr. Ben asked if they could go for a walk to get away from the dust. Yes, we'll all go, said the others, and show you around. You have to be careful crossing the dinosaur road. The dinosaurs don't mean any harm, but they're clumsy. And if one does bump into you, it can be quite nasty. They looked first one way, then the other. A large cloud of dust was approaching. They waited until the dinosaur had passed. This time when they looked, the road was clear, so they crossed. As they walked on, the countryside became greener. There were trees and streams and the air was fresh. 
The children played freely and everyone was much happier. This is where we would really like to live, said one of the men. Why don't you? asked Mr. Ben. Because there are no caves, silly, the man laughed. We'll build some, or at least something that we'll do instead, said Mr. Ben. I'll show you how to build stone huts. First, we'll need a lot of very large stones. Mr. Ben showed the men how to place the stones. As soon as they saw how it was done, they started to build several huts. Mr. Ben took the men into the woods to get some branches for the roofs. Next, the men cut pieces of turf from the ground. Then they laid the turf on the branches, and the huts were complete. The people were very pleased. From now on, we can live here, they said. A man appeared beside Mr. Ben. Um, come and look inside this hut, sir, he said. Just then, Mr. Ben heard a noise in the distance. The cave people were standing on top of a hill. They were watching the dinosaurs rush hour again. After the dinosaurs had gone, Mr. Ben went into the hut and just as he had expected, found himself back in the changing room of the shop. He took a last look at himself in the mirror and then changed back into his own clothes. Back in the shop, Mr. Ben returned the fur outfit to the shopkeeper and said, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, said the shopkeeper. We look forward to seeing you again. As Mr. Ben waved goodbye from the door, he said, I look forward to seeing you again. Goodbye. Mr. Ben walked back home along Festive Road, which was still filled with cars and lorries. Somehow they looked different now, thought Mr. Ben, and for a moment, he imagined they all looked like dinosaurs. At his gate, Mr. Ben realized he was holding something in his hand. It was a stone hammer. I wonder how long I've been holding that, thought Mr. Ben. I'll keep it. It's just what I need to help me remember. Thank you.
festive road was quiet. There was nobody about at all. Number 52 is Mr. Ben's house, and even there, there was no sign of life. Inside number 52, Mr. Ben was sitting down, thinking. I like my little room, he thought. But it seems rather small today. I'll go for a walk. Perhaps I may even visit the costume shop and have another adventure. Parked near Mr. Ben's house was a small car with a large, sad-looking dog in it. In a window was a bird in a small cage. And nearby, two boys had a rabbit in a small hutch. Mr. Ben walked into the lane with a costume shop, glad that at least he could get out of his little room. He went into the shop. As if by magic, the shopkeeper appeared. Good morning, sir, he said. Which outfit would you like to try today? Could you suggest something? asked Mr. Ben. The shopkeeper took a box. Inside was a blue uniform with a peaked cap. Try this, sir, he said. I feel this is the one for you today. Mr. Ben thanked the shopkeeper and looked to the door of the changing room. Once in the room, he changed into the uniform. What can it be, he thought, as he looked at himself in the mirror. Well, I expect I'll find out soon. And he walked through the other door. First, he thought he was in a jungle. Then he noticed a lot of cages, cages with animals in them. A zoo, said Mr. Ben. The trees are part of a zoo. Then I must be a zookeeper. The zoo was full of animals, rather sad animals, especially the crocodile with hardly any water to play in. After passing several cages, Mr. Ben came to a door with a picture of a parrot on it. The parrot house, Mr. Ben said, and went inside. Hello, a voice said. Are you the new keeper? Mr. Ben looked around, but he couldn't see anybody. Over here, said the voice. Mr. Ben looked again and found that the voice was coming from a large parrot. How do you like it here? asked the parrot. I like it, said Mr. Ben, but the animals, they don't seem to like it. Why is that? Let me out, said the parrot, and I'll tell you. Mr. Ben did as he was asked. <coughs> the parrot came out and flapped its wings. Oh, that's better, he said. Now let's go outside. Once outside, the parrot explained to Mr. Ben about the animals. You know, said the parrot, the animals like being here. They get good meals, and they enjoy people looking at them and saying how beautiful they are. 
but the cages are just too small. Mr. Ben sat and thought. Suddenly, he had an idea. He explained it carefully to the parrot. And the parrot thought it was a good plan and flew off at once to tell the other animals. Meanwhile, Mr. Ben was carrying out his part of the plan. One at a time, he let the animals out of their cages. Last of all was the lion. <laughs> Mr. Ben had told the animals to go into the trees and then, as planned, they all hid. Once the animals were hiding, Mr. Ben ran out of the zoo into the town. As he ran, he shouted, Look out! All the animals have escaped from the zoo! Look out! All the animals have escaped from the zoo! In the town, the people crowded into the square. What shall we do? Where shall we hide? They called. Mr. Ben spoke. As the animals have escaped from the zoo, that must be the safest place to hide, he said. The animals will never look for you there. Immediately the crowd shouted, To the zoo! To the zoo! And they rushed there as fast as they could. <laughs> Inside the zoo, the people crowded around and waited in silence. The animals started to reappear. The lion. The tiger. The elephant. And all the animals. Mr. Ben said, the animals are coming back. Quickly, get into the cages. animals came back and walked around. It was just like a normal zoo, except the people were in the cages while the animals were outside. Don't worry, said Mr. Ben to the people. The animals don't mean you any harm. They only wanted to show you that the cages are too small. We can see that now, said the crowd. Let us out and we'll make larger ones. The plan had worked. The animals went back to the trees and hid so that the people were not afraid to leave the cages. They thanked Mr. Ben and agreed to start on the new cages at once. The animals were quite happy to go back to their old cages while the new ones were being built. Once the last of them was in, Mr. Ben watched the men start to build the new cages. Soon it would be a zoo full of happy animals.
Mr. Ben looked for the parrot. Suddenly, a man appeared. Try the parrot house, sir, he suggested. And Mr. Ben went inside. There he was, back in the changing room of the shop. Mr. Ben gave the blue uniform back to the shopkeeper. I didn't find the parrot, he smiled. But he left this for you, sir, said the shopkeeper. And he gave Mr. Ben a brightly coloured feather. Mr. Ben was delighted and said goodbye. <laughs> In Festive Road, everything seemed to be the same, except that the boys had made a larger hutch for their rabbit. The birdcage was larger as well. And the dog had been let out of the car. Mr. Ben stopped at his gate and looked at the parrot's feather. I'll never forget that zoo, he said, especially while I have this to remind me. In Festive Road, people were going about their business as usual. There was one group of children listening to the sound of the sea in seashells that they had brought back from their holidays. Number 52 is Mr. Ben's house. But there was no sign of Mr. Ben. He wasn't in his room. He wasn't in his garden. And he wasn't in the park. Mr. Ben was by the river. He was looking at the boats and thinking about the adventures that they have. It's time I had another adventure, he thought. Time I paid another visit to that special costume shop. Inside the shop, as if by magic, the shopkeeper appeared. Good morning, sir, he said. What would you like to try today? Is that a frogman's underwater outfit, said Mr. Ben? Yes, said the shopkeeper. Try it on. Mr. Ben took the outfit into the changing room. He quickly changed. And then he tried the special breathing tube that he had to use to swim underwater. Then he looked for the other door, the door that could lead to an adventure. On the other side of the door, Mr. Ben found himself among rocks beside the sea. He walked to the water's edge. Just as he was about to jump in, there was a shout. Hey, what are you doing? The shout came from some sailors on a red boat. An underwater boat, thought Mr. Ben. A submarine. 
the captain of the submarine shouted again. We are going to look for a monster. If you see the green submarine, you can say that we shall see the monster first. Look out, we're going to dive. <laughs> crew climbed into the submarine. It slid into the water, floated away, and dived under the water. Mr. Ben was just about to jump into the water when there was another shout. Hey, what do you think you're doing? This time, Mr. Ben saw a green submarine. The captain shouted, we are going to look for the monster. If you see the red submarine, you can say that we shall see the monster first. Look out, we're going to dive. <laughs> Further along, Mr. Ben met an old sailor who said, Hello, are you looking for the monster as well? I don't know anything about a monster, said Mr. Ben. Tell me about it. Old oh, people say that there's a monster living in the water around here, the old sailor smiled. The two submarines have come to take a photograph of it. They won't leave until one of them has seen it. It's a kind of race. I see, said Mr. Ben. Well, I'm not looking for any monster. And not wanting to waste any more time, he walked to the edge of the water and jumped in. Swimming beneath the water was like being in a different world. Mr. Ben was happy to swim about, just looking at the fish. He had forgotten about the submarines until he saw the red one nearby. A little later, he met the green submarine. Those submarines are a nuisance, thought Mr. Ben, and he swam to the bottom of the sea to watch the creatures there. A seahorse, a dogfish, and all sorts of creatures. Just as he thought that he had seen everything, he saw a mermaid. She was holding something to her ear. Hello, he said. You're the first mermaid that I've ever seen. What are you doing? I'm looking for a new shell for our King Neptune because it's his birthday today, she said. Surely you can hear the sea without listening to it in a shell, he said. It's not the sea I'm listening to, said the mermaid. You listen. Mr. Ben put the shell to his ear. It sounds like, like the wind, he said at last. Yes, said the mermaid. King Neptune has one that makes that sound. Do you mean to say that you can hear different sounds in different shells? Oh, yes, the mermaid said. King Neptune has a lot of shells with sounds of the wind, rain, birds, animals, all sorts of things. That's fantastic, said Mr. Ben. I'll help you search for a new one. Whenever Mr. Ben found a shell, it seemed that King Neptune already had it. Then he found an unusual striped shell that sounded like the buzzing of a bee. Mr. Ben was pleased because King Neptune didn't have that one. The mermaid was pleased too and asked Mr. Ben to come with her to King Neptune.
Eventually, they came to King Neptune's cave. The king smiled when they said happy birthday to him, and he was delighted with the new shell. Beside King Neptune was a huge animal. Mr. Ben looked at the huge animal and asked the king, is that the monster that the submarines are looking for? Yes, said the king. It's my pet monster. Those submarines are a nuisance. They frighten him. We can't go out because of them. I wish they would go away and leave us in peace. They all sat down. Poor King Neptune, said the mermaid. It's not a very nice birthday for him. Can't you ask the submarines to go away? She asked Mr. Ben. Well, they won't go away until they have a photograph of the monster, said Mr. Ben. I may be able to help. I've had an idea. I'll see you later. And he swam back to the shore. Once ashore, Mr. Ben soon found the green submarine. He asked the captain if he'd seen the monster yet. The captain said no, he hadn't. You've probably frightened it away, said Mr. Ben. Now, if you dressed up your submarine to look like a monster, it wouldn't be frightened and would come close enough for you to photograph it. The captain thought that was a good idea and told the crew to make a monster costume to cover the submarine. <laughs> Then Mr. Ben went to the red submarine and said exactly the same thing to the captain. As soon as they were both gone, Mr. Ben swam back quickly to King Neptune's cave. Mr. Ben told King Neptune that the submarines were having a competition to photograph the monster. I've played a little trick on the two submarines. Let's see if it works, he said. <music> Mr. Ben led the way, and they hid behind a huge pile of rocks. Now watch, said Mr. Ben. In the distance, they could see a monster. That's really the red submarine in a monster outfit, said Mr. Ben. Another monster appeared. That's the green submarine, said Mr. Ben. The two submarine monsters swam around taking photographs of each other. <laughs> submarines thought they'd got a photograph of the monster and went off. King Neptune was delighted and the monster gave Mr. Ben a ride back to the shore. At the water's edge Mr. Ben waved goodbye and looked for the submarines. Sure enough they soon came past. First the red one. When the captain saw Mr. Ben he smiled and waved a photograph. Then the same thing happened with the green submarine. Suddenly, a man appeared on the rocks beside Mr. Ben and said, Well, 
They both have their photographs. I think that you deserve a rest. Come into this cave and sit down. Mr. Ben walked into the cave and, just as he'd expected, found himself back in the changing room of the shop. He changed back into his own clothes. Mr. Ben returned the underwater outfit and thanked the shopkeeper who said, Look, there's a seashell stuck to this outfit, sir. Do you want to keep it? Thank you, said Mr. Ben. It will make a good souvenir. Back in Festive Road, things were as busy as usual. There was one group of children saying happy birthday to a boy and looking at his presents. At his door, Mr. Ben stopped and listened to the seashell. He wasn't sure if it was the sea he could hear in the shell or the wind. Anyway, he said, it's just the thing to help me remember. On the pavement, in Festive Road, a group of children were playing cowboys and Indians. Number 52 is Mr. Ben's house. Mr. Ben was indoors reading a newspaper. He read that a cowboy film was showing at the cinema. Mr. Ben liked cowboy films and he decided to go and see it. When he reached the cinema, he saw a long queue of people waiting to go in. What a crowd, thought Mr. Ben. I'll never get in to see the film. Never mind. I'll be a cowboy. I'll go to that special costume shop. Inside the shop, as if by magic, the shopkeeper appeared. Good morning, sir, he said. You look as if you know which costume you want today. Yes, said Mr. Ben, the cowboy outfit. Certainly, sir, said the shopkeeper. Mr. Ben took the outfit into the fitting room. Inside the room, he changed into the outfit. looked at himself in the mirror as he usually did, and then went through the door that could lead to an adventure. Outside, Mr. Ben found himself in a rocky landscape. From behind a large pile of rocks, he could see little clouds of smoke. He went over to the pile of rocks, climbed up and peeped over the top. The smoke was coming from a fire. A red Indian was waving a blanket so that the smoke from the fire made different patterns. Smoke signals, thought Mr. Ben. 
and he looked to see who the Indian was signaling to. In the distance, he saw a town of wooden houses. A cowboy town, thought Mr. Ben. I don't expect the Indian is signaling to them. Then he saw some more little clouds of smoke. They came from a group of Indian tents. Wigwams, the Indians called them. Mr. Ben decided to have a closer look. When he reached the village, he kept out of sight behind one of the wigwams. He could hear the sound of drums. Carefully, he looked to see what was happening. He saw a group of Indians dancing round a pole, a totem pole. The totem pole was carved and brightly painted. Mr. Ben looked at it carefully. It was the first one he'd ever seen. Redskins, Redskins, we'll beat the cowboys today. We'll beat the cowboys today. Redskins, the Indians were shouting as they danced. Redskins, we'll beat the cowboys today. We'll beat the cowboys today. Redskins, Redskins, we'll beat the cowboys today. Redskins, Redskins, a war dance. Beat the cowboys today. I must warn the cowboys in the town. Beat the cowboys today. Redskins, Redskins, Redskins will beat the cowboys today. Nearby were some horses. Mr. Ben took one and rode off. In the town, Mr. Ben fired his gun to attract attention. The door of the jail opened and the sheriff looked out. Look out! The Indians are coming, called Mr. Ben. They say they're going to beat you today. We're ready, said the sheriff. They will probably beat us. They always do. Still, it's a good game. Game? said Mr. Ben. The hide-and-seek game, of course, said the sheriff. Every week, the Indians play hide-and-seek with us cowboys. An Indian and a cowboy both hide, then the Indian team looks for the cowboy, and the cowboy team looks for the Indian. The team to find the hider first wins. Every week the same thing happens. The Indian vanishes and we never find him. Sometimes the Indians don't find the cowboy, but even then it's only a draw. We never win. Just then, the Indians arrived. They smiled and waved and said they were ready to beat the cowboys again. May I play? asked Mr. Ben. Sure, said the sheriff. You can be the man to run off and hide. The two teams lined up opposite each other. At one end stood the Indian chief and the sheriff. They were the judges. At the other end stood Mr. Ben and the Indian who was going to hide. Ready, called the sheriff. Both teams knelt down and closed their eyes. Go, said the chief, and Mr. Ben and the Indian ran off to hide. The sheriff and the chief began counting. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, Nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. Mr. Ben peeped over the edge of the rock where he was hiding. In the sand below, he could see his own footprints. Oh dear, he thought. Anyone could follow those and find me easily. I must find somewhere else to hide. He looked around. Near the Indian village was a wood. Mr. Ben had an idea. He ran towards the wood, making sure that he was leaving a good trail of footprints for the Indians to follow. When he reached the wood, he climbed into a tree. 
Mr. Ben's idea was to cross the wood by moving from tree to tree along the branches so that he wouldn't leave any footprints on the ground for the Indians to follow. When he reached the other side of the wood, he was very near the wigwams. The next part of the plan was to walk backwards to the wigwams with bare feet. Now it will look as if someone with bare feet has walked from the Indian village to the woods, he thought. The village is the last place they will look for me. Mr. Ben hid in one of the wigwams. Through a slit in the side, he could see the totem pole. It looked even taller than he remembered it. There were the heads, the animals, the fish, the large bird, and the Indian on top. The Indian on top? That wasn't there before. It was an Indian, all right. The Indian who was hiding from the cowboys. Back at the start, the counting had almost finished. One hundred. The teams rushed off to find Mr. Ben and the Indian. Indians easily followed Mr. Ben's footprints to the wood. But at the wood, it seemed that he had just disappeared. Meanwhile, the cowboys had followed the Indian to the village. But they just couldn't find him anywhere. Inside the wigwam, Mr. Ben had been busy. He tied a feather to the end of a long stick. Now he was ready to carry out his next plan. Suddenly, from above the cowboys, came a laugh. The cowboys looked up and shouted with delight. They had found the Indian. Then they saw the stick with the feather. And Mr. Ben came out of the wigwam. The sheriff said, You tricked the Indians when you hid, and you found the hiding Indian. You won the game for us. Thanks to you, we won for the first time ever. You deserve a prize. And he gave Mr. Ben his badge. And when Mr. Ben asked the Indians if they would do their dance for him, even they were happy. Suddenly, a man appeared. He asked Mr. Ben to show him where he had hidden. Mr. Ben went back into the wigwam, and as he did so, he found himself back in the fitting room of the shop. Mr. Ben changed back into his own clothes.
He went back into the shop and returned the cowboy outfit. Thank you, he said to the shopkeeper. May I keep the sheriff's badge? Of course you may, sir. You earned it, said the shopkeeper. Back in Festive Road, the children were now playing hide-and-seek. At his gate, Mr. Ben looked at the sheriff's badge. He wouldn't forget that game as long as he had the badge to remind him. It was a sunny morning in Festive Road, and people were going about their business as usual. At number 52, Mr. Ben was going for a walk. He stood for a moment and watched a man trying to sell a carpet to his next door neighbor. The carpet seller's unusual clothes made Mr. Ben think of the costume shop that he knew. The shop that adventures could start from. It wasn't long before Mr. Ben was in the lane with the shop. He paused outside for a moment and then went in. Inside the shop, as if by magic, the shopkeeper appeared. Good morning, said the shopkeeper. Which outfit would you like to try today? That one, said Mr. Ben, looking at an outfit that reminded him of the carpet seller he'd seen earlier. <laughs> uh, is there a carpet with it? laughed Mr. Ben. Yes, quite a special carpet, smiled the shopkeeper. Mr. Ben took the clothes into the fitting room, changed quickly, and looked at himself in the mirror. Then, carrying the carpet, he went through the door that always led to an adventure. Outside the door, Mr. Ben found himself in a sandy place. Wherever he looked, there was sand. Nothing but sand. Time for a think, said Mr. Ben. And he spread the carpet out and sat down. As soon as he sat down, the carpet started to move. A flying carpet, said Mr. Ben. carpet took Mr. Ben to a town and came down outside the gates. Mr. Ben went into the town and 
and looked around. It was very peaceful until suddenly there was a commotion. A man was holding a boy by his sleeve. Let me go! Let me go! shouted the boy. The sleeve tore off and the boy ran away up a side street. Mr. Ben carried on with his sightseeing. After a while, he came to a square with a pond where some children were playing. He stood and watched them. Then he noticed the boy he'd seen earlier. Just at that moment, the man appeared again. Mr. Ben was rather worried for the boy, so he followed behind them, making sure they couldn't see him. The man took the boy out of the town. They stopped by some rocks and the man pointed to a hole just large enough for the boy to squeeze through. He said to the boy, inside that cave is a bottle, bring it to me. Mr. Ben watched as the boy was pushed into the cave. And it was not long before his head reappeared through the hole. The bottle, where is the bottle? asked the man. The boy held up an old green bottle. The man looked pleased, but before he could take the bottle, a huge bird snatched it and flew off. The bird has left the bottle on the rocks, thought Mr. Ben. Outside the cave, the man was shouting, Get that bottle and don't come back without it. When the man had gone, Mr. Ben went over to the boy and said, I'll help you get the bottle back. The boy was delighted and Mr. Ben flew the carpet up to the place on the rocks where the bird had left the bottle. What's in the bottle? said Mr. Ben. Let's see, said the boy. A large man appeared and said, I am the genie of the bottle. What is your wish, O oh master? Genie, said Mr. Ben. What's a genie? Well, I am a genie, said the genie. I can do anything by magic but I must obey the person who opens the bottle and lets me out. As you let me out, the genie said to the boy, I must obey you. What is your wish? What do you want? I don't know, said the boy. Could you get back into the bottle for a bit while I think, please? And the genie vanished back into the bottle. <laughs> The boy said to Mr. Ben, perhaps the genie could build me somewhere to live away from the town. All right, said Mr. Ben, we'll go and find a place where the genie can build you a palace. They flew off on the magic carpet, past the town and out into the desert. This seems a good place, said Mr. Ben. Open the bottle. <coughs> the genie reappeared and asked the boy, What is your wish, O oh master? Please, um, I would like a palace, said the boy.
The genie smiled, and in a flash, a palace appeared. That's beautiful, said the boy. But could it have some grass and flowers around it? And some trees? It's so hot in the desert, said the boy. How about some water? That's just right, said the boy. And the genie went back into the bottle. Come on, said the boy to Mr. Ben. Let's look around. It's a nice place, said the boy. But if I live here, I'll miss my friends in the town. And if I go back to the town, that man will make me give him the bottle. Well, said Mr. Ben, I've an idea that could put everything right. The boy listened to Mr. Ben's idea and smiled. He took the stopper out of the bottle. What is your wish, oh master? The genie asked. I want you to make a cave near the town and fill it with bottles just like yours. It is done, oh master, said the genie. Thank you, said the boy, and gave the bottle to the genie. I'm giving the bottle to you, said the boy, so that now you belong to yourself. And you can have this palace to live in. Now, let's fly to the cave, said Mr. Ben. But before they could use the carpet, there was a flash. And they found themselves in the cave. It was just as the boy had asked for it to be, full of bottles. Lots and lots of bottles. Next, Mr. Ben hid while the boy went into the town to fetch the man. After a while, Mr. Ben heard the man come into the cave and start to search for the bottle with the genie in it. The boy and Mr. Ben watched, but they knew that the man could never find the bottle that he wanted. A little later, the boy slipped away to find his friend. A man appeared beside Mr. Ben. Uh, come outside a moment, sir, he said. Mr. Ben smiled. He knew what to expect. He walked out of the cave, and there he was, back in the fitting room of the shop. He changed back into his own clothes. And returned the outfit. I do enjoy my visits to your shop, said Mr. Ben. Thank you, said the shopkeeper. See you again soon. From the door, Mr. Ben waved goodbye. Back in Festive Road, children were playing as usual. At his gate, Mr. Ben went to get his door key out of his pocket. But instead, he found the stopper out of the genie's bottle. I thought I'd thrown that away, he said. Now I can keep it to help me remember.
It had been a wet, stormy morning in Festive Road, and although the rain had stopped, there were still puddles of water about. Number 52 is Mr. Ben's house, and he was at his window looking at the sky. Ah, that was a nasty storm, he thought. But the sky is clearing now. I'll go for a walk. I think it's a good day to visit the special costume shop. Inside the shop, as if by magic, the shopkeeper appeared. Good morning, sir, he said. Which costume would you like to try today? I don't know, said Mr. Ben. I'll close my eyes, turn around, point, and then see which costume I'm pointing at. This one, said Mr. Ben. And he took the outfit into the fitting room. Inside the room, Mr. Ben changed into the outfit and then looked at himself in the mirror. It looks a bit like a pirate's costume, he thought. And still wondering, he walked through the door that could lead to an adventure. Outside the door, Mr. Ben found himself on a ship, a sailing ship. He looked around. At the top of the tallest mast was a flag, a black flag with a skull and crossbones on it. The Jolly Roger flag, thought Mr. Ben. This is a pirate ship. I must be a pirate. And all these other men must be pirates too. Suddenly, from the lookout above Mr. Ben, came a shout. Ship ahoy! Ship ahoy! At the back of the pirate ship, a door opened. It was the captain, Captain Tempest. Right then, let's see if you can act like proper pirates, called Captain Tempest. Catch that ship and bring me its treasure. Mr. Ben wondered what was happening and looked over the side of the ship. In the distance was another sailing ship. Mr. Ben said to a man standing close to him, Do you think you can catch that ship? Oh, yes, said the man. But we won't. Why not? asked Mr. Ben. I thought the captain wanted to rob it. He does, said the man. He always wants to rob ships, but the rest of us don't. It's always the same. Each time we're supposed to catch a ship, we pretend to sail badly. We've never caught a ship yet, laughed the man. Captain came back onto the deck. He was furious. You've done it again. You've let them get away, he roared. Call yourselves good sailors. You couldn't catch a boat in your own baths. We are good sailors, said the man to Mr. Ben. But we won't be pirates. Just then, there was a shout from the captain's cabin. 
Bring me food and drink. From down below, the cook appeared, carrying a tray of food. Take this tray to Captain Tempest, he said to Mr. Ben. The captain was looking at a map spread on the table, a map of an island. What's that island? asked Mr. Ben. Well, said Captain Tempest, pirates usually bury treasure on an island and then make a map of the island and mark the place they buried the treasure with a cross. This is a map of my island, but we haven't captured any treasure, so there aren't any crosses. Mr. Ben went back onto the deck. Ahead, he could see Captain Tempest's island. And it was not long before the ship was tied up at the island. The sky became very dark. It's a good job we're back. There's going to be a storm in a minute, said one of the men. And it'll be very dangerous out at sea. The storm started. Suddenly, from the lookout, there was a cry that Mr. Ben had heard before. Ship ahoy! Ship ahoy! The sailors rushed to the side of the ship and looked out to sea. There in the distance was a ship being tossed about by the wind and the waves. They're sure to be wrecked if no one helps them, said one of the men. Can't we help them? asked Mr. Ben. The captain would never let us, said another man. Trick him, said Mr. Ben. You've tricked him before. Say that it's a treasure ship and you want to capture it. But hide your pirate's flag so the other ship won't worry about you being pirates. In this storm, Captain Tempest won't notice. Right, said a pirate. You get the flag, I'll tell the captain. Mr. Ben hid the flag inside his shirt. By the time the captain came up on deck, they were already on their way to rescue the other ship. Captain Tempest was pleased to have another chance to capture some treasure and even more pleased at how well the men sailed the ship in the terrible storm. They really were very good sailors. Pirates brought the other ship safely back to their island. By the time they got to the island, the storm had stopped. The crew of the rescued ship cheered the pirates. Hip -hip. Captain Tempest was pleased. Then he remembered that he was a pirate and said, We only saved you so that we could rob you of your treasure. <laughs> to his surprise, everyone, even the pirates, laughed as if he was joking. <laughs> That's a good joke, said the other captain. If you are pirates, 
Where is your pirate flag? Captain Tempest looked up at the top of the mast. There was no flag on it. Anyway, said the other captain, we haven't any treasure, only a cargo of fruit trees and other plants. We'll give you some to plant on your island. Mr. Ben had an idea. He held up the map of the island and said to Captain Tempest, you mark the map with crosses and where you put the crosses, we'll plant the trees. They can be treasure trees. One of the sailors started to play a tune as Captain Tempest marked the crosses. Then everyone joined in the music. Mr. Ben was pleased to see everyone so happy. A man appeared beside him and said, Will you come into the captain's cabin a moment, please, sir? He did as he was asked. And there he was, back in the fitting room of the shop. He changed back into his own clothes and went back into the shop. He returned the pirate's outfit and held up the Jolly Roger flag. I found I still had the flag under my shirt, he said. You can keep that, sir, said the shopkeeper. Captain Tempest won't be needing that again, thanks to your help. Thank you, said Mr. Ben from the door and waved goodbye. <laughs> Back in Festive Road, the sun was shining and a fruit van was making deliveries. At his gate, Mr. Ben pulled the flag out and looked at it. The biggest souvenir I've ever brought home, he said. Just the thing to help me remember. Festive Road was being repaired. At number 52, Mr. Ben looked out of his window. What a noise, he said. I think I'll visit the costume shop. He put on his coat and hat and was soon at his front door. From there, on his way up the noisy street. It 
It wasn't long before he left the noise and he was outside the shop. Mr. Ben went in. Inside the shop, Mr. Ben looked at the outfits that were there. He started to chuckle. Ooh. <laughs> Suddenly, as if by magic, the shopkeeper appeared. Hello, sir, he said. Which one amuses you? The Roman one, said Mr. Ben. Romans made good roads. Ah, the Roman gladiator, said the shopkeeper. Why don't you try it, sir? You know the way. Still chuckling, Mr. Ben took the outfit and went through the door to the changing room. Inside the little room, Mr. Ben put on the Roman clothes and admired himself in the mirror. Then he went through the second door. Not the door back to the shop, but the door that went... Where this time, he wondered. He found himself in the countryside. Among a group of people who were busily digging. Carrying and constructing something. Mr. Ben, said a voice, what are you doing here? Mr. Ben recognised the large man who had called him. Smash a Lagru, he said. Fancy meeting you. What are you building? A road, said Smasher. It will go straight to the city and the arena. Just then, there was a fanfare of trumpets. Here comes the Emperor, said Smasher. We always put on a little show for him. He blew a whistle. All work stopped. Then one man held up his thumb and another sighted an instrument at it. Smasher winked. Lining up the road, he said. It's the straightest road I've ever seen, thought Mr. Ben. It keeps the Emperor entertained and we get a break. As the Emperor left, he called to Mr. Ben. Gladiator! Bring that big fellow to the arena. He should amuse us. What does he mean? asked Mr. Ben. He collects men to fight the gladiators, said Smasher. Now he wants me. I'd forgotten the gladiators fight, said Mr. Ben. Fighting is silly. And so say all of us, said Smasher. As they walked behind the Emperor, Mr. Ben got his first sight of the arena. It was the biggest building in the city. When they got there, Smasher was put with the other prisoners. Mr. Ben went into a room filled with worried-looking gladiators. Hello, he said. You don't look very happy. What's the problem? Because we're going to have to fight, of course, said a man. If you're so worried about it, why fight? asked Mr. Ben. The Emperor, said the man. We do as he says, or it's thumbs down. Thumbs down? Mr. Ben looked puzzled. Look, said the man. If the Emperor turns his thumb down, it means a squidging for someone. Thumbs up, they go free. Then there are the lions. Lions? Squidging? 
How awful, said Mr. Ben. Listen, I've an idea. After he'd explained the idea, he went to the prisoners. You were right, Smasher, said Mr. Ben. Nobody wants to fight, but I've got a plan. He explained his idea again and then said, I need to hurry back to the road. Mr. Ben went back to the road and found the man with the sighting instrument. Then together they set off for the city. When they got there, Mr. Ben took the man to the arena. You'll be up there, on top of the arena wall, opposite the Emperor, and where he can see you, said Mr. Ben. You know what you have to do. I'm off to see the Emperor. The Emperor was about to go to his seat ready for the next show, when Mr. Ben arrived. The road is being built in your honour, O oh mighty Emperor, said Mr. Ben. But to lead it straight to you, we need your help. He told the Emperor what he had to do. The Emperor smiled smugly. I've seen the road being lined up. I know what to do, he said. Next, Mr. Ben fetched Smasher and took him to the lions. I see, he said. Look, the Emperor is able to release the lions by pulling a lever by his seat. They go to the arena by this tunnel. Come on, let's change the direction. Then he said, I'm going to need your whistle as well. The changes were finished just before it was time to enter the arena. Instead of fighting, the two sides began a kind of football match. They chased each other and played all kinds of tricks to entertain the crowd. Sometimes they even kicked the ball. When at last a prisoner fell, the Emperor prepared for a thumbs down. Immediately, Mr. Ben blew the whistle. The Emperor stiffened. Then, seeing the man on top of the wall, he smiled. Aha! Time to line up the road, he thought. He held his thumb up. The prisoner left the arena free. After that, whenever anyone fell, Mr. Ben blew his whistle. And the Emperor held up his thumb for freedom.
Finally, the Emperor became furious. The lions! He roared. Let's have the lions! That was the signal for everyone to fall to the ground. Mr. Ben whistled, and up went the Empress Thumb. The prisoners and gladiators cheered. Thanks to Mr. Ben, they were free. With a roar, the lions arrived. But because of the changes made by Mr. Ben and Smasher, not in the arena as expected. Instead, they appeared right beside the Emperor. That was when the crowd decided to go home. When last seen, the Emperor was still running. I like the way you made him put his thumb up, said Smasher. <laughs> he lined up the rope and I whistled, Mr. Ben winked. <laughs> Smasher laughed. It's time I got back to that road. See you, Mr. Ben. Hope so, Smasher, said Mr. Ben. Good luck. Just then, a familiar voice called to Mr. Ben. This way, sir. The man pointed to a door. Mr. Ben went through the door and found himself back in the changing room. He put on his own clothes and then went back into the shop. As Mr. Ben returned the Roman clothes, the shopkeeper said, you can keep the whistle as a souvenir, sir. Mr. Ben was delighted. At the door, he turned and waved. Thank you again, he said. See you soon, I hope. Festive Road was still noisy with the roadworks. When he got to his gate, Mr. Ben took out the whistle. I wonder, he thought. He gave a sharp blast. At once, there was silence. While the workers wondered what was going on, Mr. Ben slipped into his house unnoticed. What a nice souvenir, he thought. <laughs>